Russell Hughes, and I will be the one doing the instructions for today. So the idea of these special area types are essentially to hide information, right? There's no reason that we have to learn all routing information. And for those of you guys that were here this morning when we were talking about the different LSA types, one of the things you saw is that we take type one and type two LSAs and convert them into a type three LSA to advertise all of our routes from one area up onto all other areas. If we should happen to have a router that does redistribution, like in this case from EIGRP into OSPF, we have what is known as an autonomous system border router. We're advertising outbound how to reach this ASBR with a type four LSA, and those external routes become type five LSAs, external routes in OSPF. Now, a couple things that we're looking for when we deal with the idea of these special area types. First off, we're trying to block these LSA types that we're having. Not all of them, but some of them. One of the things you're gonna see is that we need to make sure that any router in OSPF knows about all routes within inside their own local area and a way to get out. That is the minimum amount of information any router in OSPF can actually know about. So you're gonna see that with the first type of area that we have that's a special area is known as a stub area. And stub areas are typically you dealing with the idea that there's only one way in or out of that area. In this case, right over here in area number 50, we have this ABR1 right out over here. And the idea is that if we want to get to any other area, it's got to go through ABR1. If we want to get to external routes, we still got to go through ABR number one. So the idea is why advertise all that information into this internal router in area 50? Instead, what we could just do is to send in a default route. So stub areas will block type five LSAs at the area border router. I, we learn these external routes here. Let me just erase this so we can kind of see it again. So let's say I've got a route of a 192.168.1.0 slash 24, okay? And that's learned via EIGRP and then redistributed into OSPF and advertised out onto everybody in OSPF. By default, type five LSAs are spread throughout the entire autonomous system. Well, the whole idea here in Area 50 is that there's only one way in or out. Why do you need to know about that external route if I could just give you a default route saying, hey, if you don't know about it, send it to the area border router and see if they can get to it from there. So the stub areas are turned on to block these external routes. I'm going to learn about it on the area border router. But instead of sending that into area number 50, we're going to instead advertise a default route. Okay. So once we enable this as a stub area, you should see any router that's in area 50 is going to be set up and you're going to see no external routes whatsoever in any of those routers in area 50. Now, this stub area is a, a, a common thing. It's part of the RFC for OSPF. Okay. So it is something that is definitely open standard that we're utilizing within OSPF. If you're looking at like a standard area, they're showing area 51 out over here. Right? The idea would be that any OS, uh, OSPF LSA can be dumped into area 51. They need to know about all of that information. So Cisco takes the idea of that stub area a couple steps further and created what they called a totally stubby area. Now the idea of a totally stubby area is that it still conforms to the standard OSPF. All routers in the area 50 out over here see it as regular stub area. The big difference, the only router that has to be a Cisco router would be this area border route. And what it's going to do is to not only block those external routes, because you gotta go through the area border router anyway, it says, why do you need to know how to reach the autonomous system border router? If you don't have any external routes, you're not gonna to need to know a type four LSA. So they will block type four LSAs going into that area. Likewise, it says, you know what, if we're giving you a default route, why do I give you the routes on all other areas in OSPF? 
One of the things I could do is to just send in a default route and block not only type 3, but type 4 and type 5 LSAs from getting into that area. This allows me to say everybody in Area 50, these routers in Area 50 out over here, are going to have the minimum amount of information that we can possibly have in OSPF. A route to get to every single link in Area 50 and a default route, how to get out back. Okay. As they show, the idea is this is a Cisco proprietary feature, but like we mentioned, the only router that has to be a Cisco router is the area border router. Again, you're going to see what we're going to have to do. Remember that to become neighbors in OSPF, we have to agree on what type of area it is. Okay, So they have what they call the stub area flag. That area, every single router in that area has to understand that it is a stub area. The area border router, in this case, would say area 50 stub, no dash summary. It says don't send in those summary LSAs, those type 3 and type 4 LSAs that tells you how to get to everything else in OSPF. And instead, again, send in a default route. So you're going to see these routers over here, these internal routers in Area 50, are only going to have O routes in the routing table, intra-area routes. And they'll have one OIA route, an inter-area route, and that will be my default route. That will be pointed out onto the area border route. Okay. It says, essentially, to get to anything that's outside of Area 50, you've got to go through the area border router to get to it anyway. So there's no reason for me to know that specific information. Totally stubby areas used quite often when you're dealing with the idea that we only have one single router as the area border router in that environment. Now, one of the problems with both a stub area and a totally stubby area is it does not allow any type 5 LSAs. So that means if we don't have any type 5 LSAs, we're not allowed to have an autonomous system border router in that area because they're going to take these routes so they're redistributing them and they're going to advertise that as a type 5 LSA. Exactly what we're trying to block in a stub area. So they came up with an idea known as a not so stubby area. And not so stubby areas work just like you see a regular stub area. We're blocking any type 5 LSAs coming into this area and instead injecting a default route. And that happens here at the area border route. So notice it's blocking this type 5 LSA and instead injects a default route into that area. But it allows for a router in that area to be an autonomous system border route. And to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to essentially kind of fool OSPF. As I take this 172.16.20 network and I redistribute it in OSPF, it gets sent in as a type 7 LSA. By default, it'll show up in your routing table as an ON2, an OSPF NSSA type 2 route. It's an external route. Essentially, these are the exact same thing as a type 5 LSA. But like we said, type 5 LSAs are not allowed through a not-so-stubby area. So we fool OSPF by sending that external route in as a type 7 LSA. Notice that that type 7 LSA eventually then gets converted into a regular type 5 LSA at the area border router when it gets sent out onto every other area on that network. Okay, so I'm blocking any external routes from any other area in this autonomous system, but I still allow for the idea of this autonomous system border router inside that NSSA area. And again, not so stubby areas are part of the OSPF standard. Okay. Now, again, what you're seeing in this case right here is that we would still allow type 3 and type 4 LSAs into this not-so-stubby area. So Cisco has decided, let's take that one step further. Let's go in to make this a totally not-so-stubby area. I want to block type 3, type 4, and type 5 routes in here. LSA types to get into this area, but allow for us to have an autonomous system border router. Okay, Again, the only router that has to be a Cisco router would be this area border router here. And it's blocking both type 3, type 4, and type 5 LSAs, 
and instead injecting a default route into this totally not so stubby area. But it allows for this idea of an autonomous system order route. Again, they redistribute these routes in OSPF and they show up as a type 7 LSA. So an ON2 by default in the routing table. As it reaches the area of order router, they convert that into a type 5 LSA. Shows up as an OE2 to the rest of the OSPF network. A regular external route. So the only difference is we're blocking both type 3, 4, and 5 routes and sending in a default route at the area of order router. And we mentioned it is a Cisco proprietary feature, but the only router that needs to be Cisco is this area of order router here. You're going to see, again, all routers in this area have to agree on what type of area it is. Okay? So all the routers in here will have area 1 NSSA. The area border router will have area one NSSA, no summary. Don't send in type three and type four summary LSA types. That's what we're looking for. Okay. But again, it allows for that idea of an autonomous system border router doing that redistribution from say EIGRP into OSPF out over here, which is not normally allowed in a stub area. Now, this dramatically reduces Things like routing table size that we have here in this area that we're looking at. Instead of having all of these different types of LSA and how to reach every other area and every other subnet in the rest of the autonomous system, I instead have a default route. It also minimizes the topology change. If one of these routes in area, let's say 51 or 52, goes down, nobody in this not-so-stubby area has to reconverge for that. Right? So we reduce on things like CPU utilization and memory utilization and processing time on the local routers and reduce how many times we have to run the Dijkstra's algorithm. So it's good information to be able to go through and do this information hiding. I always kind of think of it, uh, uh, the idea of, I, mean, I come from Nebraska, right? And I could tell you guys about every possible road in Nebraska where there's construction, but most of you have probably never been to Nebraska. Right, so the idea is giving you all that detailed information about what's going on within Nebraska is really just kind of a waste of time. You've never been there. Right, so rather than me giving you, hey, here's everything about Nebraska, why don't I just tell you Nebraska is still there. If you ever need to go to Nebraska, then ask me and I'll get you more precise directions. Okay, Be a much better solution at that point in time to be able to, than to try and fill your brain with a whole bunch of useless knowledge. Right? And it's the same thing that we're trying to do here in OSPF, hiding information about the rest of the network to say, hey, what you really need to know is how to get out of this local area. Now, they show us this idea that NSSA and totally NSSA area, where we mentioned by default in a stub area, it doesn't allow for an autonomous system border route. Right? So in a not so stubby area, what they have is the idea that when I'm doing redistribution, it gets advertised in the OSPF as a type seven LSA. That type seven LSA, as it reaches the area border router in area number one in this case, gets converted into a type five LSA and flooded throughout the rest of the autonomous system. So we are blocking those type five LSAs from getting into this NSSA area. And instead, I'm advertising a default route. For you to get to any of these external networks, everything else uses the default route, pointed out under the rest of the ADR. Now, we still allow type 3 and type 4 LSAs in area 1 in a regular stub, a not-so-stubby area. A totally not-so-stubby area says, let's block not only type 3 LSAs, but type 4 LSAs that tell us how to get to the autonomous system mortar route. They also block these type five LSAs from going into that area. And again, still allow for an autonomous system border route. So I'm getting the benefits of going through and saying, you don't have all the information about every other area, but I still have the availability to be able to run a not so, uh, or a uh, autonomous system border router in that area. Informational hiding. And I'm advertising that default route into that not so stubby or totally not so stubby area. Okay. So we mentioned the idea that NSSA, they support an autonomous system border router. They accept type seven LSAs that are advertised from that ASBR. 
which are then later converted into a regular type 5 LSA, which looks like a regular external route to every other area. I do accept things like type 3 and type 4 LSAs. I'm blocking, however, the idea of the type 5 LSAs. Now, uh, they've made some changes in the new versions of code when you go to 15.0 code. Notice now they're also blocking type 4 LSAs as well. And it kind of makes sense. If you're not getting any of these type 5 LSAs, how to reach those external networks, there's no reason to know how to reach the router ID of the autonomous system border router advertising it either. I'm just going to use the default route in that case. Where we said totally NSSA areas, they block type 3, type 4, and type 5 LSAs. Right? So not only external routes, the type 5 LSAs, not only the type 4 LSAs telling you how to get to the autonomous system border router, but also type 3 LSAs, how to get to every other route in any other area in the OSPF network, and instead sends in a default route. Okay? But it allows for the idea of having that autonomous system border router in that area which is the benefit of having an NSSA area. Now, as you go through and create this stub area or not so stubby area, you're gonna see that from the area border router, it injects a default route. So we can have some issues within here when we have multiple area border routers. In this case, what we're looking for is to use a primary ABR, and if that should fail, only then will we use this secondary autonomous system border route, or, or excuse me, area border route. So the idea is we want to play around with the cost of this default route that they're injecting into area number one. That's a stub area. By default, the cost that's getting sent in is going to have a cost equal to one. Okay, And that's going to be my best route going outbound. If we choose to, on this secondary ABR, when I go through and say area one stub, I can then say area one default dash cost and make that 30 or 40, for instance, an OSPF. Now, router one and router number two are gonna be learning two different default routes. One has a cost of one and the other one has a cost of 40. I'm obviously gonna choose the lowest cost path and use the primary ABR to get outbound, okay? Likewise then, if that should fail, my backup route is through the secondary ABR. Okay. Now, we can also go through and leave the cost alone, in which case then it's gonna be more of kind of a load balancing of those area border routers as well. What we would be looking for is that we get a default route that has the exact same cost. We'd be looking for which one is closer, router number one or router number two, area border router number one or area border router number two at that point in time. Okay, what's well, my best way of being able to get to those destinations? Let's see, and I think that's pretty much what we've got for you guys. Unless any of you guys have any questions, any of you guys have questions about special area types in OSPF? All right, well, that's pretty much what I've got for you as far as special area types and the different types of areas that we have other than a regular area in OSPF. Okay, the four different options, we, like we said, Stub area, totally stubby area, not so stubby area, and totally not so stubby areas. And thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Have a nice day.